So I give you a short um, sort of prelude to limits of detection and quantitation in an earlier video in this series, um, but now I'll give you a little bit more information and then I'll show you an Excel uh, setup how to how to compute these. There's a there's three different ways that I'm going to show you. There's more than that uh, out there, um, but I'll show you the three ways that might be useful in this class and um, in just any measurements going forward that you might do in science. Um, the, the, one of the more common ways is to um, compute the limit of detection using what's called a blank sample. And a blank is a sample that um, to you and based on your best ability has um, no analyte present. So often a blank sample is um, DI water or ultra pure water, nano pure water, as clean water as you can get if, you, if your sample is um, water based or has a water matrix to begin with. You want to match the matrix as best you can but just have zero analyte. Uh, to the best of your abilities. In which case you'll have one of those blanks. So you'll have uh, a blank solution um, and uh, you're going to take that, put it into your instrument um, and you're going to measure that seven times. The same exact sample or blank in this case. You'll measure it seven times which means you'll get seven measurements. You'll take the standard deviation of those measurements um, and you will compute the limited detection um, by taking three times the standard deviation in whatever the response units are. So if it's units of absorbance, then you'll take um, the standard deviation of the absorbance values um, times three, and then divided by m being the slope of the calibration curve that you're using to quantify your samples. That's the, the, the sort of basic uh, way to uh, measure the limit of detection um, using just a simple blank sample uh, measured seven times. Second method is the one I alluded to earlier um, and you can do this directly from a calibration curve and this is the one that I use more often because almost always I'm generating a calibration curve if I'm doing a measurement and so I have that in front of me. It doesn't require any extra measurements like it would for the first version where you'd have to have this blank and measure it seven times. So from the calibration curve itself um, from your data you can um, compute the standard error in Y for each of the measured X values for um, your calibration curve. So these are the, the um, these are the response values for your standard. So if you shot in five standards into your instrument, um, you would take the standard error in Y um, and you can measure that in Excel very simply, I'll show you shortly. That's going to be your SY here. So three times that value divided by, again, the slope of the calibration curve. The slope of the calibration curve is simply a, a, a unit conversion factor because it's going to convert your response units, which um, your standard deviation is measured in, into um, concentration units, which is ultimately how you'd want to report a limited detection. It doesn't make sense to report limited detection simply in terms of response units because that's arbitrary depending on the instrument you choose. What is helpful is to report it in units of concentration because then it's ubiquitous and can be related uh, and referred to by other scientists that didn't do your specific measurement. The third method is a little um, what I'd consider a quick and dirty method. Um, you can estimate the uh, limited detection from the signal to noise ratio. And so what is the signal to noise ratio? So the signal to noise ratio is the relationship between the response that you get from pure amount of analyte versus the response that you get that's just intrinsic to the background of the instrument itself, uh, usually electronic uh, or thermal noise that are contributing. So if you're collecting, say, an absorbance spectrum of a dye, that would be absorbance versus wavelength, not concentration here. I'm not talking about a uh, calibration curve. I'm just talking about a normal old absorbance spectrum uh, in units nanometers here. Um, that might look like you have sort of a baseline like this, nothing's happened, and then all of a sudden it starts to ramp up where your dye starts to absorb, and maybe you have a couple absorbance lines that look like this, and then you have it mellow out and uh, reach the baseline again. If we were to zoom in on the baseline, the area where there is no analyte, it's just the background signal, and I were to expand that out to uh, sort of a zoomed in perspective, what we'd see is uh, a non-flat line, right? It, there's an actual amount of signal that's being generated there. That is the noise level that's intrinsic to whatever the mechanism or the method that we're using for detection. It's probably due to the detector itself and the electronics that went in to construct it, amongst other things that you'd, be, you'd learn about in an instrumental class. 
So the height of this, the amplitude, um, actually the, the peak to peak amplitude here, so from uh, the peak to the trough here, uh, that's the noise measured in our response units absorbance because this is still on the Y scale. Whereas the signal then would be from the centroid of that baseline all the way up to wherever the maximum signal is for our analyte. And so this would be our signal. And so if you take the signal in absorbance units divided by um, our noise, that's the signal to noise ratio. Of course, for any measurement, we want to maximize our signal to noise ratio because that's going to give us better resolution of our actual response of our signal relative to the noisy background. If we have a really small signal relative to our noise, how do we know it's a real signal? And it's not just continuation of noise. So for an estimate of LOD here using this, uh, we can take three times whatever that signal to noise ratio is. Again, signal being whatever that value is measured in absorbance units versus whatever the, the, the noise value is in absorbance units. This is a pretty quick and dirty way, but it's nice because if you have a spectrum, you can very quickly estimate the, the, the detection limit by just looking at a spectrum. You don't even need a calibration curve.